our presenter tonight uh, is Elaine Wolfie Kessinger. She has a lifelong love of history and a passion for bringing history to life for others. She's been researching and sharing history for over 20 years. Her interest in the female staff of the Army Medical Department comes much as it did for the female staff themselves from that TAM period from a want of something to do. Today, female nurses and matrons are frontline heroes, but this was not always the popular perception. Join us in the for Women's History Month for a look at the five years that turned public opinion around when the women nurse went from fussy mother and flighty debutante to a woman warrior in the battle for health. Bust the myths and explore stereotypes of Civil War nurse as she finds her professional feet. That being said, I hand the floor over to you, Elaine. Okay, um, thank you, Paul. Um, and uh, while Jeff gets the slides set up, um, as I, <laughs> as Paul said in, in the uh, initial blurb, it is not only Women's History Month in March, but today happens to be um, International Women's Day. And so I am very excited to be able to talk to you today about um, some of the women who made quite an impact on medical care. <laughs> so the <laughs> phrase that uh, we, we said was something to do. And that comes from Hospital Sketches by um, Louisa May Alcott. And I will share just a little bit of it um, with you to start off. So chapter one, <laughs> I want something to do. This remark being addressed to the world in general, no one in particular felt it their duty to reply. So I repeated it to the smaller world about me, received the following suggestions and settled the matter by answering my own inquiry as people are apt to do when very much in earnest. Next slide. Write a book, quoth the author of my being. Well, I don't know enough, sir. First live, then write. Oh, mm -hmm. Try teaching again, suggested my mother. No, thank you, ma'am. 10 years of that is enough. Take a husband like my Darby and fulfill your mission, said Sister Joan, home on a visit. Can't afford expensive luxuries, Mrs. Copitty. Turn actress and immortalize your name, said Sister Vashti, striking an attitude. I won't. Slide. Go nurse the soldiers, said my younger brother, Tim. Tom, panting for the tented field. Hmm. I will. <laughs> Go ahead and give the next slide, please. So we have an idea of the hospital nurse. We have that mental picture. Who's been in a hospital? Pretty much all of us, right? Do you remember your nurses? Do you remember who cleaned? Do you remember who brought your food? Or did your laundry? Or who took you from place to place? Today, we have very specific tasks assigned to specific caregivers. And heaven help the one who confuses the LPN with the RN. <laughs> okay, this was not the case in the mid 19th century hospitals, but it is a product of these same mid 19th century hospitals. And before we can understand how the military hospital nurse of the Civil War era became a professional, 
we need some common working terms. This particular research journey is difficult because standardized terms were not assigned to standardized tasks. Not every hospital had a matron that inventoried the ward furniture and some did and called her a nurse. And some had nurses scrubbing the floors and windows and some had a washwoman. And some had nurses who changed bandages and some only allowed their nurses to cart the bandages away to be laundered for reuse. Some had matrons cooking and plating food daily and some ha had them presiding over the holiday dinner while the dining room girl served every day. So from the carded service records, which we'll explore further later on, we can compare the terms with tasks that are mentioned in further sources like letters and memoirs and publications. So the titles that were available for a pension were nurse and matron. And for the federal medical department, they were given most often the tasks that we would come to associate with a nurse and they use them somewhat interchangeably. So I will tend to use them interchangeably in this presentation too. So let's get started. Next slide. So when the military of the United States was newly formed, the idea of a woman providing care, patient care in a military hospital wasn't at all unusual. The Army Register will give the pay and provision scale and a list of tasks for the female attendants in a military hospital quite readily. The 1852 report on the West Point Military Academy suggests that a hospital matron is quite needful and they feel the lack because they don't have one currently. This is because the usual manner of dealing with an illness or an injury recovery starts with mother. And so too does it today in, in most cases. Uh, next slide, please. So when we're ill, we first go to mommy. <laughs> So say you have something like a tummy ache. She'll probably start with some food remedies like uh, mint tea or ginger ale, trying to discern, okay, is this, you know, just eating too much or is something really wrong? She might go towards over-the-counter re remedies like Pepto or Imodium. If the food isn't working, or she's out of the over-the-counter remedies, or she wants a little bit of advice, she'll next go to the apothecary. And um, today that would be things like Walgreens, um, CVS, Rite Aid, same, same kind of system. And if the over-the-counter remedies aren't working, Finally, she calls in the doctor. She still has some power. She has charge of seeing the doctor's instructions followed or not. She also sees to the cleaning of the slop, you know, slop spools and chamber pots and laundering of soiled clothing and ensuring the patient is cleaned up. And she will entertain the board, confined to bed rest, and she will cheer the rehabilitation on and she will listen to the stories in the middle of the night and she'll close the eyes of the dead and she'll prepare the dead for burial. And this is just what mother was expected to do. So in true military fashion, each hospital was issued a mother or four. Next slide, please. As the 19th century progresses, the Army Register and the regulations of the Army allow fewer and fewer female hospital matrons. They do retain the four regimental matrons that we see in the Civil War era revised regulations of the US Army. 
in the war with Mexico, which if you're forgetting that is 1846 to 1848, these laundry matrons, usually wives of regular army NCOs are the sole women we see with a campaign military. In Britain, Florence Nightingale's work with the military hospitals in the war with Crimea, 1853, was seen as a revolutionary new concept. So what changed in that generation? And that's the concept of the separate spheres of influence. Men had the care of the public sphere, such as war and medical care and the army, and women had care of the domestic sphere, such as caring for young children, cleaning, cooking. The practicalities blurred the line somewhat, like who was gonna cook for war? <laughs> who would clean a hospital? The civilian hospitals prior to the Civil War were seen as a last resort of the truly desperate. So whenever possible, patient care was done at home and in the care of family. While each civilian hospital, infirmary, and medical clinic had matrons to call upon, especially for the women's wards, these were not always the type of women you might expect, and these, were, these women were not given the tasks that you might expect either. Most hospitals would serve as a practicum lab for beginning surgeons and physicians, and the patients in their turn served as the experimental subjects, not always with their permission or foreknowledge. As the patients were often unable to afford medical care in any other way, they were seen by society as less than human, having committed the sin of poverty. And it was the religious-based charities that ministered to these deserving poor out of pity and hope that these depraved creatures would be redeemed from the moral degradation that led them into poverty. So just as the male church elders filled the board of directors of the hospitals, so, to the, so did the female church elders seek fundraising and outfitting of hospitals and setting up the moral codes that were imposed upon the patients. And if idle hands are the devil's plaything, the appropriate creature, they finally decided to clean and launder and watch over the hospital patient is the female inmate on work release from a prison or workhouse. So many of these early female hospital staff were paid in drinking alcohol and kind of took an indifference to their duties because who cares if they're sober or tidy if they're scrubbing the gory bits from the surgery floor and not really much better than the patients themselves, not really fully human after all. And the military was quite certain they didn't want these kind of women <laughs> to have influence over their servicemen. And they blocked at the idea of that kind of a woman as a hospital matron. War was men's business and women should leave the men to it. <laughs> well, except maybe Catholic sisters in the plague ward or immigrants in the laundry, because those aren't really women. Well, not, not really. Next slide, please. At the start of the Civil War, oh, I'm sorry, one more slide, please. <laughs> At the start of the Civil War, there was only one military hospital and there were a few old sailors homes, but those were more like an assisted living facility for uh, sailors and Marines who had matured beyond service or the ones who had to um, convalesce after a grievous injury that really didn't have any kind of family to take care of them. The one hospital, as we would understand the term, was in St. Louis and served as a depot for the regular army at the frontier postings. So as the war begins in earnest, the medical department themselves are scrambling around to organize and care for both the casualties of the early battles and contagious illnesses among, among the gathering soldiers. 
they too are putting into place the protocols for their own professionalization and some of which we still use today. Again, the prevailing theory is that war is men's business and they really did try to keep women out of it as much as they could. The regiment would have a surgeon or several whomever would volunteer with the men of the unit and pharmacists would serve as hospital stewards or surgeons or be detached from the regiment to help out. And when they had an organized hospital, enlisted men on detached duty had the task of patient care, cleaning, cooking, even laundry. The regimental command was generally unwilling to uh, detach that many rifles from the ranks. So the patients themselves had to serve as nurses caring for their fellow patients. So I don't know about you, but when I'm sick or recovering from a surgery, the absolute last thing I wanna do is care for somebody else. <laughs> yeah, cleaning, back your way. Cooking, yeah, nothing sounds good but sleep. Wake up and help you to the bathroom for the fifth time tonight because you're hurting and bored and want to chat. Ah, oh, heck no, let me sleep. Mommy, make him stop. So many of the patients, of the early war military hospitals wrote home of their conditions. And the women at home in turn went to the military hospitals determined to correct what they saw as gross negligence. Next slide, please. So Mary Bickerdyke was sitting in church one Sunday morning, hearing a report from a parishioner who had volunteered. And he had experienced quite the same kind of, of chaotic military hospital. So she gathered up some treats and news from home and some male church elders, a chaperone, and traveled to the hospital. And she found absolute chaos. And she couldn't find anyone to address <laughs> the concerns of the patients. So she set about finding the mobile patients themselves and setting them to work. And when the surgeon finally <laughs> took notice of her and who the heck are you? She gave him quite a piece of her mind. And his response is, I, I yeah, you go ahead and take care of it so long as you stay out of my way. And so she did. And she came to be known as Mother Bickerdyke. And she was 44 years old at the time. Um, I say that because it gives, you know, my, my fellow ladies a pause. <laughs> Wait, 44 and she's getting mother, really? Um, Another of these hospital patients who wrote home, wrote to his brother, who in turn came to the hospital with the intention of nursing his relative back to health. And that was Walt Whitman. So as the volunteer units were trained up and deployed to the front alongside the regulars, the medical department began to settle into the protocols. And they began to take note of the deficiencies of those protocols. A typical scenario would go something like this. Next slide. So a soldier was wounded in battle and his unit moved on. They'd come back for him when they could, if they could, just hang on, we'll get to you. After the battle would calm enough, the surgeons, hospital stewards, and whomever was detached <laughs> would go looking for their particular casualties. So if the casualty was mobile, he'd try to make his way to wherever a field dressing station or a field hospital was set up and hope that it was for his state or commonwealth, his particular regiment. And this often took several days for several reasons. First, they were sorting them by regiment and state or commonwealth. It wasn't enough just to find the federal, <laughs> federal army, you had to find, you know, the, the third regulars or the 28th Massachusetts or your particular unit. Um, 
Next, the ambulances were not under the direct control of the medical department. So they were appropriated by command for other reasons. Uh, getting civilians out of the line of fire, uh, getting ammunition to another part of the battlefield, whatever the captain decided he wanted to do. <laughs> um, and finally, because there were was no designated group of people to take the casualties off the field. So, you know, they kind of played hot potato a little bit. Not it. <laughs> um, once our casualty is stabilized in the field dressing station or the field hospital, he was moved to a staging area for transport by train, ship, or ambulance to a general or volunteer hospital for treatment. Eventually, if he needed it, he'd be sent on to a convalescent hospital that's even further from the front, <laughs> or he'd be um, furloughed home. Um, so between the time that our casualty was wounded and the time he was processed into the general or volunteer hospital, he's kind of in paperwork limbo from a military standpoint. And I'm sure those of you who were in the military can tell you that paperwork limbo is not where you want to be. Um, he's declared a presumed casualty on its unit's roles and he's not yet entered into the hospital roles. So they're really unable to issue him any kind of food, water, medicine, clothing. Uh, he'll likely be issued some food and water uh, within the stabil stabilization process. And he'll likely get the first doses of pain management as treatment for his injuries. Here's the kicker if the surgeon has access to sufficient of his supplies from the baggage train, which may or may be as much as five miles away. So it was in this kind of limbo time that the civilian relief organizations stepped in. Um, so you get purveyor nurses like Clara Barton and Cornelia Hancock who rush in with supplies, they provide immediate, you know, um, what would be essentially first aid. <laughs> um, and they kind of tie things over until the medical staff can get access to sufficient of their own supplies and can kind of take over. Um, the local women, um, when faced with casualty on the doorstep, also provided patient care. Um, the battles were not always, you know, in a nice pristine field like for association. Um, you know, they were in someone's cornfield, someone's wheat field. Um, so uh, the local women would provide supplies, uh, not always willingly or graciously. Um, and many of them would come to be called nurses of the war, but the women themselves considered their work at this point very different than the professional nurses in a hospital. Um, more to, you know, what, what was I going to do? Any woman would provide care, this kind of care. We also have the... Um, aid organizations like the United States Sanitary Commission and the United States Christian Commission, who likewise had agents, usually men, often civilian physicians, who would rush in with supplies and assist in the initial medical care. And they also would station agents, in this case, not always men, near to the staging areas for transport to provide food and treats and clothing, an uplifting word, whatever they could do. And it was their habit to ask the surgeons at the field dressing stations and field hospitals what was needed in the days after the battle and kind of make sure that, you know, they had everything they needed. 
When Surgeon General Hammond replaced Surgeon General Finley in early 1862, he was able to appoint Surgeon Letterman who had a plan <laughs> to address the deficiencies in this rather convoluted protocol. He put the ambulances back under the control of the surgeons themselves so they would have them when they needed them. The surgeons, assistant surgeons and hospital stewards were evaluated for their skills, knowledge and talents and reassigned at the brigade level rather than the regimental level. So there was no more looking around for your own. You treated whatever federal came your way and they would sort out the paperwork higher on up. They established protocols that we would come to call triage. So rather than, again, sorting based on regiment or unit, the casualties were sorted based on who had a chance of surviving the care. And they established a dedicated ambulance corps. And so there was no more hot potato trying to decide who would retrieve the casualties. These new protocols were tested at South Mountain and Antietam. And by December of 1862, the uh, Sanitary Commission agents came to Fredericksburg prepared for the usual assistance. And they were surprised and delighted to discover they needed to supply only a few stoves and warm clothing and blankets. Dr. Bink is the Sanitary Commission agent and here's what he has to say. Sir, on the 13th of December, intelligence having been received that the successful passage of the Rappahannock by the army under General Burnside, I received instructions to proceed to the field and aid in forwarding the labors of the commission. Then began the busy scene so often reenacted at the depots of the commission near battlefields. The recently organized hospitals were visited and supplied with necessaries not provided by the medical department of the army. Food, clothing, woolen shirts, drawers, and socks, blankets, lint bandages, hospital and kitchen utensils were liberally dispensed and assistance was otherwise rendered to the wounded. Uh, he goes on to explain that uh, um, thus were in all 18 division hospitals, either consolidated or independent, and these were all visited and their wants supplied. And he goes on to tabulate all of those hospitals and what they, what they needed. Most of them, he notes, are deficient only in blankets. Well, it's December of, you know, <laughs> that's pretty good. He concludes with, in consequence, however, of the provident care of the medical department, the medical purveyor was more amply supplied than on any previous occasion. There was therefore less pressing nece uh, necessity for this form of relief and less suffering upon other memorable battlefields. So with the more organized professional protocols in place within the medical department, these kind of aid organizations were able to turn their focus towards um, fundraising, establishing volunteer and convalescent hospitals and helping the soldiers in other ways. One of the favorites is the soldier's rest which provides warm meals, riding supplies, mail service, overnight accommodation to the traveling soldier and celebrities were known to make appearances. And this sounds an awful lot like the foundations of the USO, Hollywood canteen, stage shore canteen, servicemen's clubs. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> Next slide, please. <laughs> So once our casualty is stabilized, he's sent on to a general or volunteer hospital. These were hospitals that we would recognize as such. They were stationary, were far removed from the worst of the fighting and near transportation supplies. 
They were often near a large urban center like Washington City, Philadelphia, even New York City. And some developed in cities that became crossroads of conflict like Frederick, Maryland, Harpers Ferry, West Virginia, or Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, the patients were usually brought in by train and ship. A few of them arrived by ambulance. And these were the hospitals that Dorothea Dix sought to revolutionize with female staff. Within the new Letterman system, as explained by J.J. Woodward in the Hospital Stewards Manual, this was a very organized place indeed. Next slide, please. So if we think of the hospital like a body, the surgeon is the brain. He's making the decisions and directing the other parts of the hospital to function. The hospital steward is the heart. He keeps the paperwork flowing, communicating directions to each section. He compounds medicines and keeps the recipes. He sees that the wards are clean, well ventilated, furnished, and that each item is inventoried and kept in good repair. He sees that each patient's personal effects are inventoried, organized, stored, and maintained properly. He sees that meals are delivered in a timely manner. The foodstuffs are accounted for, the vendors pay, the kitchen's clean, the kitchen tools inventoried, maintained, used appropriately. He sees that each patient is given a meal consistent with his prescribed diet and gets help to consume it if he needs it. He sees that the laundry is done in a timely manner and returns to the appropriate ward and that all of the laundry tools are inventoried, maintained and used appropriately and that consumable products are inventoried and reordered in a timely manner. He sees that visitors to the wards are behaving in a manner conducive to the patient's rest and healing and, and, and in short, he has a very, very big job with a lot of responsibilities and he needs help. In our ideal world, in the mid 19th century, they hoped that men could provide this help. And as we saw, the patients themselves just weren't able to, that was not a viable option. They tried to get civilian men to help and there just wasn't enough. So finally, they decided to give women a chance. Each hospital was allowed to organize themselves in their own way and they did. <laughs> so again, some women were allowed to change bandages, some weren't. Some allowed women to you know, comb, comb the hair, provide barber, barbering and some didn't. Uh, very few allowed the women to wash more than face and hands. They would call in a male attendant for a full bath. Uh, some allowed women to organize religious services on Sundays and holidays. Most required the women to clean empty chamber pots and slot bowls and oversee the meals and medications. Most women had to do laundry, but only occasionally was it you know, the same matrons that were providing the patient care. A few of the hospitals had women cooking, the most preferred the men for that. And that led to some of the most dramatic conflict between female staff and military staff. And we'll return to that <laughs> in a few minutes. Um, when there is a vacuum in hierarchy, the sociologists show the involved parties will naturally seek to create a hierarchy. And so too was there a vacuum in the hierarchy in the female staff. And they too sought to create that hierarchy. Some women came from a socioeconomic status where they had servants to do the grubbiest cleaning. So when tasked by the hospital to scrub the operating floor, they claimed they couldn't possibly, they, didn't they have an immigrant or a black woman to do that? <laughs> so too, would they fight over the choice or tasks like letter writing or entertaining the bedridden? They were a matron, not just any old nurse, thank you very much. So too, did some women offer their medical opinions freely and sometimes against the prescriptions of the surgeons. 
and a surgeon under no obligation to explain his directives to anyone, much less a woman, became understandably frustrated and outraged, not just at this one woman, but all female staff. So Mr. Woodward in his work, the hospital steward's manual gives a suggestion. It will generally be found convenient where female nurses are employed for the surgeon to appoint the most intelligent and reliable to be directress of female nurses, whose duty it shall be to supervise, to oversee the washing and the distribution of clean clothes, the linen rooms and its appurtenances, the issue of delicacies for the sick and the extra diet kitchen for their preparation. The remaining female nurses will in every case have their special duties designated through the directress by the surgeon in charge they may be conveniently assigned to the care and the cleanliness of patients as to dress in person, the supervision, preparation, and administration of extra diets and beverages, and such wa uh, watching and other care of the sick as the medical officers may direct. In addition, one or more nurses may be employed in the linen room in mending and taking care of clothing, et cetera, and et cetera. And he goes on <laughs> at length to uh, detail the duties of the hospital steward and how various attendants of either gender may be of help. So in 1863, Surgeon General Hammond informed the hospital surgeons that female staff from Miss Dix would be appointed to the hospitals unless they employed someone of their own choosing. And most had already by that point accepted staff, female staff without Miss Dix's intervention. Slide, please, thank you. So 1864, the medical department had their protocols in place. The hierarchy of female staff was sorted under a directoress and the relief organizations had a clear idea of how best to offer the most needed help. The world noticed and wanted to know how they could follow our example because clearly we were doing something very right. So it was natural for a comparison and evaluation to be made by the Army Command, the Medical Department Command, and each person involved. And one such evaluation led to a suggestion by a woman named Annie Wittenmeyer. So you'll recall that I said the hospital kitchen provided one of the most traumatic conflicts and also that each hospital was permitted to handle the day-to-day -day in their own way. Uh, slide, please. Hospital diets are sorted into three main categories with an extra category for special items. And the three main categories are based on the ration system. So a regular diet is comparable to what a regular soldier would receive in garrison or fort posting. The low diet is a half portion of the regular diet. And a special diet includes foods thought at the time that would promote healthy nutrition during healing. So you'll see a lot of the you know, beef tea and farina and a lot of the soft foods that should be familiar to most of us who've been in hospital. Um, the main hospital kitchen was responsible for these three diet meals and enlisted men were most commonly the cooks for the hospital. Contraband men were the next most commonly employed as cooks, but the extra diet kitchen was the sticky wicket. The relief organizations would often provide food treats for the hospitals, such as citrus, pickles, lemonade, an entire holiday dinner. The female staff themselves sometimes took it upon themselves to procure treats for the patients too. And when these needed to be cooked, the conflict arose over who would do the cooking, what kitchen would be used, what cookware would be used, and even where they would store everything. And the female staff sometimes got in the way of the military cooks and sometimes offered harsh criticism of how the cooks ran their kitchens or the cleanliness of their kitchens. 
Some of the female staff thought they ought to be in charge of all the cooking, both ration-based meals and the extra diet treats. After all, cooking was a woman's business and the men should let them get on with it. By 1864, most of the hospitals had reached a compromise that worked for them. But Annie Wittenmeyer made the official suggestion to Surgeon General Hammond that became the accepted protocol. She suggested the woman take charge of the extra diet cooking and a section of kitchen and storage be devoted to the same. The main cooking and kitchen should be under the direction of a culinary matron, female, but the cooks being men enlisted or contraband. Said culinary matron, like all the female staff, reported first to the directoress and then to the hospital steward. For the most part, this was just an official sanction of what most of the hospitals had worked out for themselves, but now it was on paper. It was official. They were professionals. Slide, please. So 1892, <laughs> okay, the peace accord had been signed and the volunteer soldiers returned to civilian life and most of the hospitals were disbanded. Most of the surgeons returned to the role of physician, treating colds and tummy aches and the occasional occupational injury. The hospitals hospital stewards returned to the apothecaries, dispensing sodas and cough syrup and health advice. The hospital nurses though, <laughs> some returned to keeping house and raising children. Some turned their considerable energies towards social reform. And a few revolutionized the civilian hospitals with professional patient care and occupational training for a new generation of nurses and matrons. As the years passed, the idea of a pension was brought to societal consciousness. The soldiers were affected by their service and the American public agreed that they ought to be noted, rewarded and given help when necessary. The women felt that they too had fought a battle against disease for health and were forever changed and they too needed help and they need, too needed to be noticed and rewarded. And with armed conflict on the horizon, they needed to recruit new military hospital nurses for a new war. So this is an era that saw the publishing of many of the memoirs and stories of the hospital nurses and the experiences of the women during the war. This is 30 years after time had dimmed the memory and softened the personalities and glossed the experiences into an epic tale of romantic battle glory was she really such a fierce dragon? Could anyone really have been that perfectly good? Was he really such a dastardly villain? Perhaps if we can look close enough, we can see the truth through the haze. So nurses and matrons in military hospital were authorized to receive a pension in 1892. To apply for that pension, an informational file was filled out. These were collected into what's called the carded service records. And the National Archives holds those today and they are seeking volunteers to help transcribe them. So, hey, if you've got time, they would love your help. So from the carded service records, an author by the name of Jane E. Schultz gathered statistics for a book called Women at the Front, Hospital Workers in Civil War America. And they give an indication of the women who staffed the military hospitals and what data was needed to prove service. And we're gonna take a look at a few now. Slide please. There were recorded 21,208 files total. Now, these were uh, women who served in the medical department, federal medical department, not the Confederacy. Um, 
And for the most part, they sorted out the matrons that accompanied the regiments in the field. They separated those out from the ones who worked in the hospitals themselves, established hospitals. They have files for 6,284 who were titled nurses, 10,870 were titled matrons, 1,011 were cooks, 2,189 were laundresses, and Various others had titles like chambermaid, dining room girl, seamstress, or left their specific title blank. Um, next slide, please. As soon as you get into Civil War era, um, female nurses, <laughs> female medical staff, you will hear about Dorothea Dix and how she was appointed superintendent of female nurses and how she was quite the dragon lady with a whole lot of opinions on exactly what kind of woman she wanted in the military hospitals. But we want to look at exactly how much power did she have. So of the 21,208, she appointed seven, uh, I'm sorry, 371 nurses, 6%. She appointed 195 under the, ter uh, under the title matron. That's less than 2%. She appointed four cooks, which is less than 1%, and four laundresses, which is an even tinier portion of less than 1%. So the other 94% <laughs> were appointed in several other ways. Uh, some of them were sisters of charity who, um, who pretty much showed up, volunteered and said, hey, put us to work. Um, some of the women were appointed by writing to a statesman who would in turn write on to a surgeon or someone higher up in the military and they would get appointed that way. Some were referred by a friend. But yeah, she appointed 6%. <laughs> so while she took those first steps and should be honored as such, keep it in perspective, please. <laughs> Slide. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so we did have women of color, just as the uh, United States color troops were getting started in the army, so too were women of color coming into the female staff. So they account for in total about 10%, which is uh, commiserate with um, the number of uh, USCT in the Army. So as you can see, under Cooks, a whopping 36%. So they definitely tried to put Black women as cooks, 14% as laundry. So they tried to gear the um, black women into cooks and laundry, the scut work, 
out of proportion to, uh, to their numbers. Next slide, please. So here we are again on uh, <laughs> uh, International Women's Day during Women's History Month. And we see from a uh, saintly mother to slovenly creature to a frontline hero, we see the evolution of professional patient care. So I'm about to name drop. <laughs> Because of Dorothea Dix, women are a vital part of the military hospital administration. Because of Phoebe Yates Pember, women are a vital part of the supply team for hospitals and everything is inventoried, stocked, and conveniently assembled. And because of the work of the Lady of Ward E and Mother Bickerdyke and hundreds of other patient care providers, your nurse is gonna be taking good care of you today. And because of Lucy and Betty, your hospital room, the surgery suite and surgeon's office will be cleaned, well ventilated and free from nasty things you don't wanna think about. And because of Greta and Bridget, your laundry will be clean, returned promptly and well mended. Because of Annie Wittenmeyer, you will have nutritious food appropriate to your care, prepared safely in a kitchen that is run with calm efficiency. Because of Cornelia, Cornelia Hancock, Clara Barton, women are combat medics, MASH staff, and the Red Cross will ensure your care is appropriate even among your enemies. Because of the United States Sanitary Commission, the United States Christian Commission, service persons will have a holiday meal, inspiring card, care box, entertainment, no matter where they're stationed. Because of Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell, Dr. Mary Edwards, women can fill even the highest medical roles in the military hospital if their skills, education, and assignments align. Because of Susie King Taylor and Dr. Rebecca Lee Crumpler, women of color are able to serve in the military hospitals, limited only by their assignment. So while the Civil War solidified the professional reputation of patient care providers, these women changed hospital care in ways we still feel today. Next slide, please. So this is me <laughs> and I have portrayed a directoress uh, at events at the Lee Fendall House, Liberia Plantation, uh, Fort Washington National Park, Harpers Ferry National Park, and many living history events. Uh, please note my email address. And as Paul said, um, if you would like to read lots further, uh, I have compiled a reading list. Uh, most of them are free sources available through Google Books, Gutenberg Project, Hate Trust. Um, you can email me directly for that or get it from the Facebook group or eventually the website. Uh, next slide, please. And there is a list of the direct uh, quotes and sources. Yay, I survived. <laughs> okay. Um. Well, thank you very much, Elaine. I, it was very interesting learning, you know, it, it isn't just the big famous names, obviously. It's everyone who came together, the, the unsung heroes that history has unfortunately forgotten about. And thank you very much for bringing it up to our attention. Uh, I open the floor now to uh, questions from our participants. And remember to take yourself off mute. <laughs> Elaine, uh, just a quick question for you. Um, I know the, the focus of your talk, of course, was on the, the federal army. 
and the trials and tribulations of the professionalization of uh, the women for that army went through. But uh, in your studies, did you come across anything for their Confederate counterparts? Did they have a similar type of professionalization or is it just strictly ad hoc? They have uh, many of the same, um, they make set many of the same milestones, but because the federal army won, <laughs> they're the ones who got publicized. <laughs> um, we have uh, many of um, the plantation owners' wives who uh, kind of find themselves uh, wanting something to do. So they organize a hospital. <laughs> hey, I'm, that's where I'm gonna put my money and my resources. So they do. Um, they were more apt to, yes, Trish. Wasn't Phoebe Pember in a Confederate hospital? She was, she was um, for the second division of Turum, but um, it was in Richmond. That's yes. all I can remember. <laughs> I get the battle during the Mexican war and the name of the Richmond hospital swapped around or something. <laughs> word. I think maybe um, it's the same word. Chimborazo. Thank you. Chimborazo. Thank you. <laughs> it's either um, Shimborazo Hospital or Winder Hospital. Those are the two that immediately come to mind as the big general hospitals in Richmond for the Confederate Army. Yes, it's Chimborazo was Phoebe Pember Yates. Um, okay. The, within the Confederate hospitals, they were more apt to um, sort the tasks on a uh, class basis and more bluntly on a, on a color basis. Um, they had uh, black women, they called them nurses. They were doing the cleaning, the laundry, um, some cases cooking, um, bulk of the cleaning. They had white women who were matron, titled matrons who were doing you know, patient care, as we would understand patient care. They, they had that, they were more apt to have that line where the federal army, um, federal hospitals blurred that lines more often and use the titles interchangeably. Um, One of the wonderful things about Phoebe Pember is that she wrote that wonderful account of her experiences she did, today. and that's on my reading list. I promise yeah. you, Trish, I didn't forget my Confederate sisters. I didn't. I know, I know. Just <laughs> a little pointer. I just, that's my shortcoming because I haven't read the list. <laughs> just as a quick uh, sidebar, the uh, that list that we're referring to is currently posted uh, on the Rappahannock Valley Civil Roundtable's Facebook page. It's the most recent posting we had uh, earlier this afternoon. So you can read it all there. Or you can email Elaine directly. Yep. <laughs> Speaking of which, the entirety of this uh, presentation will be posted later this week on our YouTube page. Uh, I believe we, are, we have at least seven and this will be number eight that's uh, posted on our, uh, our, our YouTube page. So uh, if you want to rewatch, if there was something you might have missed, if you have a friend that was interested but they weren't able to make tonight's presentation, uh, later this week it'll be posted uh, onto, our, again, our, uh, our YouTube page. So are there any more questions out there? I had a question. Go ahead, Trish. On the um, on the graphic with the uh, nurses that were black, and it was ten percent of the nurses that 
were available who were black is how does that compare with the national population? Is that sort of even with the population or is that more? That than is not one of the statistics that she gives. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, she only notes that it is um, about even to uh, the US color troops. Yeah, I think that's- And again, and again, those statistics are taken from the carded service records. So they're not going to include um, all of the all of the enslaved women who worked in Confederate hospitals. Thank you. Um, if you want to find out about some of the uh, Southern women's, um, some of the Southern women were able to get pensions uh, through their state or Commonwealth. So you can che start checking archives of the state or Commonwealth and, and they should have those kinds of records. Okay. Well, um, Jeff, do you have anything uh, before we sign out? All right, well, again, I thank everyone for bearing with uh, our initial oops with the slideshow and I appreciate everyone's patience on that. And uh, of course, next month, let's see, bring out the calendar for April and I believe it is the... Well, I'm showing it's on April 12th. April 12th, that's even April better. Let's be, we'll talk about the Battle of Balls, Balls Bluff. And our presenter will be Mr. J. No, say again. Joseph Gillespie. Oh, Joseph Gillespie will be our presenter on the 12th of April, 7.30. Same uh, Zoom time, same Zoom channel. So. Thanks, Jay. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> and again, I thank everyone for uh, coming out and bearing with us. And I look forward to seeing all y'all next month by Zoom. And hopefully... Before summertime, we'll actually get to see each other again in person. And with that, I uh, sign off. <laughs>